we're going to discuss about uh, composite structures and this is this will be specific to building applications you can have composite structures in bridges there are some advanced composites you know for even uh, in automobiles or space shuttles and things like that but this is specific to building applications as we are already aware of about today's topic the term composite basically can be defined as when there are two or this material no third thing and they are combined to serve a functionality or a purpose so our classic example is reinforced concrete reinforced concrete members are already composite members because you have the bigger matrix which is the concrete and we are reinforcing concrete with steel and we know concrete is good at uh, taking compression uh, that's a classical statement it's not like and uh, steel is good at taking tension it's not like steel is bad at taking uh, compression it's equally good we just have to look for some slenderness effects buckling criteria for steel but it's equally good in tension and compression steel the concrete it has very little capacity in tension so we reinforce concrete with steel now this has been there since cement and concrete has been introduced the reinforcement concept what about composite now what is the difference between a composite member and a regular reinforced concrete member so as the term states concrete if it's reinforced for preventing the crack in the concrete or where the tension is happening that's called a reinforced concrete member now usually it will have the rebars and the tie bars and stuff like that but in uh, in composite members we are talking about structural steel which could be an i section or a box section uh, encased by concrete or filled with concrete we take the maximum utilization of both the materials which could be very high the load carrying capacity and other advantages are very high with composite members so that's the basic difference between an rc reinforced concrete member and composite members where we use structural steel not reinforcing steel so this will be the overview of the presentation we have a slight introduction right now Uh, then we look at what are the other fundamentals with composite structures uh, what are the different members or elements or systems and subsystems in a composite building obviously the advantages and uh, why composite structures are of a topic recent days in the building industry how it is performing by utilizing composite structures and what are the basic design considerations which should be taken care of while designing a composite member we'll be looking at an example as well as a case study of a of a building which is being executed what will be the opportunities no have when we have a knowledge of uh, what is composites and how to design them how to build them how to execute them so moving on we already saw the definition of a composite two or more distinct members are being combined to serve a functionality it could be anything like or it could be load carrying uh, load carrying capacity or you know uh, to prevent slenderness and uh, etc traditionally on the on the right side the upper image you can see it's a tapered footing with a pedestal and a column is rising from above this is a the reinforcement cage and we are going to cover it with concrete so this is a reinforced concrete now the image below you can see there is column which is already casted below and inside which there is a steel member a structural steel i section and you can see a couple of bolts and those, those that is a splice connection this connecting one steel column to the steel column above and there are four girders which is joining the steel column now you can see these girders and steel members are prefabricated in a factory and is brought to site and it is assembled connected with bolts or welding which are be the connection detailing then we cover it with concrete and form the concrete column now this this upper portion which you can see the visible steel column it will be encased with concrete now this column is called composite column which is a steel section is encased by concrete right the i section is inside in the center of the column and we are covering up with concrete now concrete serves as a fire protection and also gives the robustness or the slenderness effects you know we need minimal sizes for the member of the column because column is under compression if you have huge very tall columns the slenderness is a criteria which i all which we already saw the steel could be slender if it's going beyond a certain height or depth or you know in in whatever form and when it faces compression so in order to avoid that this serves as an advantage also you cover it with concrete and by this way of assembly things are very faster because you bring the steel elements from factory on site you assemble and you quickly pour concrete around it yes and similarly you you can see a decking system on the right side of the same image above which will be pouring concrete topping which will act as a slab so it's a blend of both concrete and steel construction that's why it's, it's faster advantageous safer and also currently we have design codes and there are minimal rooms for error when compared to a pure steel building when we go for a composite construction the history of composite uh, usages as i mentioned when reinforced concrete came into place 
at that time itself, in late 1890s, uh, yes, people started exploring with composite members. For example, a beam, an I section, which is a flexural member, which is a horizontal member, was encased with concrete and it was used in a bridge in the US in, nine, in 1894. So after that, the ACI committee, American Concrete Institute, and uh, AISC, American Institute for Steel Construction, and many other uh, organizations in each respective country started forming and they wanted to formalize the design and approach. So the research and standardization goes some way. So it, it took some 30, 40 years and after which we got the first code and design guidelines in, I know starting from 1940s, 15 onwards. But still only concrete members or reinforced concrete was picking our speed. But currently in Indian market, we started looking at composite structures due to obvious advantages we will see in the next coming slide. So before going on to composite structures in building applications, which has structural steel covered or encased with concrete, there's another composite called advanced composites, which we usually call as uh, fiber reinforced polymers, FRP, or you know the fiber could be carbon fibers, glass fibers, or aramid fibers. So glass fibers and uh, carbon fibers are mostly used. So you can see CFRP stands for carbon fiber reinforced polymer. Now, these kind of members can be applied in three ways. One is for strengthening of a member. So if there's a slab and we, you, you see we need to increase the load carrying capacity of a slab or a beam, both are flexural members, we can attach the FRP to the bottom of that members wherever we need tension, wherever it's experiencing tension and the load is partially transferred through strain compatibility through bond action to the FRP elements, which is stuck below. So this is one of the applications. Second thing is currently we are seeing in infrastructure like bridges, which are particularly built in marine environments are being reinforced with FRP rebars. Now the advantage is with uh, steel rebars, usually you know we, it, it experiences corrosion. In, in tough exposure conditions, we need to give a very dense concrete and uh, huge covers and we need to take a lot, lot of precaution to make sure rebars are not corroded. But FRP rebars, have an advantage, it, it, it is non-corrosive. Now, the industry is starting to apply FRP rebars in those kind of environments because obviously it's non-corrosive and the strength is way higher. It's four times higher than steel rebars. And you can also make, on the right side, you can see a building with uh, chevron bracing or diagonals. This, every it looks like steel, but it's made up of FRP only, completely. You can make building elements like beams, columns, other slabs, even railings, everything with FRP. And this has advantages of non-corrosiveness and uh, particularly in uh, scientific buildings where you don't want any uh, radioactive or electromagnetic disturbances, uh, these kind of materials are sorted. So this is one aspect of composites or advanced composites, which are again used in uh, automobiles and uh, space applications also. Now we'll get back to our topic of composites in building applications. All right. So we obviously have some advantages, which we'll be looking at quickly. The thing is we are utilizing the maximum or efficiency of both structural steel and the concrete. The member sizes could be very smaller, you know, obviously compared to a pure steel member or a pure concrete member. The load carrying capacity is high and the speed of construction is very fast. So we saw a case in there. You can see on the image below on the right side. These things are prefabricated and we are just assembling on site and quickly pouring concrete around it. So it's faster. And when you can build a building two or three months before schedule, when compared to a concrete building, you can start renting the building out, right? So you start getting the rent money from your clients as soon as possible. So time is money. So we are looking at that advantage also. And obviously compared to heavy concrete members, when you are decreasing the size of the members by using the composite action, a big column, especially the gravity members. When I state gravity members, gravity members are flexural members, which could be the slabs and the beams associated with them. And the loading on top of the slabs, which could be your tiles and other superimposed dead loads and everything. So the dead load of the gravity members, by using a composite action, we have steel beam below and a composite deck above. We are reducing the overall load of the gravity members. Hence, it comes down to the columns, right? Everything, all gravity members have to be carried on by the vertical members, which are columns and walls or shear walls or structural walls. Now the load that is coming on to the columns also decreases. So ultimately it trickles down and, and the load that is coming on to the foundation also decreases. So we have reduction in the loads, which will cause a reduction in the member sizes and that will cause reduction in the cost. Now, obviously fire resistance, steel alone should not be left because if, if, if it catches fire, which we saw in the classical uh, case of what happened with the World Trade Center, you know, the twin towers got crashed because of uh, the flights uh, hitting them 
And one thing they majorly observed was at a particular temperature, 600 or 700 degrees Celsius, steel alone cannot take it. It quickly loses its load carrying capacity, it buckles, and uh, you will, it will fall down. So we need minimum fire resistance for steel. Obviously, you can have some fireproof painting, some sort of polymer around the steel members. But again, a slenderless criteria we saw, you know, we, we need the minimal size of the columns to be in something based out of some design concept. So obviously concrete cover provides you the fire resistance also. And it has, in terms of uh, lateral resistance, when there's a seismic or wind force, composite members, when compared to pure steel members, has some little more ductility and toughness into it. Because when you take a regular RC members, the ductility is given by the rebars only. But in composite members, we have the I section inside it in addition to the regular rebars. So it provides more ductility because we got more steel in it. So you can find some advantages in the uh, seismic and wind applications and its associated resistance. And uh, the next two points also, rigidity and stiffness and damping characteristics are also part of uh, the lateral resistance regarding earthquake and wind. Now, one more question for you guys to think and maybe you can uh, answer at the end of the um, Q&A. Is it advantageous in the current environment to go for composite in terms of environmental benefits? Now, obviously, our building industry accounts for 10 to 12 percent of carbon emissions because of the cement usage and all. So what about steel? Are we going to reduce the carbon footprint because of steel? The one point we have to consider is, yes, of course, concrete is utilized a lot and it has a lot of carbon emissions. I think for one ton of concrete, uh, cement produced, it's around one ton of CO2 produced, something of that sort. But steel also has a lot of embodied energy or embodied carbon in it. Like the production of steel also takes or gives away carbon emission, which could be much higher than concrete. But one advantage is you can reuse steel. You can take the scrap steel and roll it again, you know, the roll sections, and you reuse steel in building applications or any other applications. So in that way, uh, already produced steel can be reused and that can save in carbon emissions. This has both ways to look at it. So think about it. And another need for composites is, let's, let's talk about tall buildings, for example, because composites are usually used for buildings which are not, you know, like uh, not small at least medium scale or tall buildings. And obviously we saw it as faster construction things. So in the market trends, anything that is constructed faster, even though it could be not very tall, if it's a 10 story, 12 or 20 story building also, you can save money by quickly completing the building construction and start you know, utilizing it or giving it for rent. But before this kind of uh, speed advantage, also compulsion or need to go for composites itself that started raising in the 1960s and 70s. On the left side, so I, have, I took a graph from a book by Dr. Taranath. It's uh, the book title is Tall Buildings, Structural Design of Tall Buildings, Steel and Composite. It's written a couple of series and, and, and I recommend you to read that book if you're uh, interested in tall buildings. Now you can see on the left side of the graph, the y-axis has number of stories, obviously 20, 40, 60, and it goes to 140 stories or floors. Now, when we are increasing the number of floors, the gravity system remains the same. What I mean by that is the floor is going to be typical only. So we have a floor of certain sizes, you know, certain slab thickness, certain beam thickness. That gravity, that plate, floor plate, is going to be repetitive in each floor, right? Because it depends on the floor plan, nothing else. Structurally, it's going to be the same. The quantity is going to be the same. That's why you have a straight line, the first line, which starts, and it says you have the quantum of steel, structural steel, required per square feet area of the building. Just think about it. For right side, we have the quantity expressed in terms of steel quantum. On the left side, we have the number of stories. So the number of stories both up. The gravity system has, not, it's, it's not increasing. You have to multiply with how many stories into the quantity of one particular story. That's going to be the weight of the slab. But the column sizes will increase because all the load has to come down to the column and it has to be carried on to the foundation below. So as we go down column from top story to bottom, it is accumulating more load from each stories, each floor plate, and we have to increase the column sizes as we go down. That is why you can see when, when the building is going beyond 80 floors or something like that, we have to significantly put more material in the concrete to carry the entire weight of the building. Now there's another interesting aspect. Now we have looked at only gravity system, the going from, from even 40, 50 stories, that is the cost requirement for the lateral system, which could be shear walls, or bracings in order to stabilize the building, in order to avoid not deflecting so much in the lateral direction, it could be X or Y direction. We need to invest so much in the material 
for for the lateral system so that kind of starts from even 40 50 stories so we have to you know what i mean by gravity system and the lateral system is you size a column for only gravity and that could take care of the lateral system also around you know 30 40 stories you know it could be you know more or less okay or on the same level but if you are increasing the number of stories and the effect because of the lateral forces also increases and you need to start in investing more more sizes in the lateral bracings that cost is significant so in order to avoid so this was happening when they had pure steel members or pure concrete members later on composites when we use in you know steel in conjunction with uh, concrete it could be composite members or the entire system composite members column slabs girders shear walls and even diagonal members these are members what about system like you can you can have a steel framing and also a concrete shear wall so that is a composite right when you look at the look at it at, at the building level at the system level so there are various combinations you can play with and find efficiency in the member sizes to reduce the overall cost of the build uh, these braces or diagonal members are like uh, non buckling diagonal members because we have a steel member inside which is around which is encased by concrete cubes and it's filled with concrete mortar and that is discontinuity there is no strain compatibility between them so that it doesn't buckle you know diagonal braces either experiences tension or compression in order to avoid buckling of the steel member inside we are again similar to columns where we are utilizing the action of the composite by encasing it with concrete as i talked about the composite members these are the different members which the composite can take you know uh, obviously our slabs slab beam combination also apart from composite beams and girders columns we saw an examples shear walls also could be composite meaning instead of only reinforcement rods inside a shear walls shear walls are nothing but it's a structural walls which is taking part in the lateral resistance or the percentage of reinforcement increases we might have to use steel plate itself instead of rebar inside these shear walls so in that uh, applications we call it uh, composite shear walls composite diagonals we just saw the picture in the previous slide and we have the entire building which could be a combination of steel and composite uh, that's what we call subsystems or this building system some of the design considerations in a composite slab so what is a composite slab it has to utilize both the steel and the concrete and we are talking about structural steel not the reinforcement steel you can see the structural steel is below the concrete on the right hand side uh, there's a slab above so so if we are not using something called shear studs on top of the steel member which is like it looks like nails or bolts what happens is the steel being below is only going to carry the load of the slab above so it becomes like a dead load on the steel beam now if we are introducing something called as a composite action by use of the shear studs at some spacing say 300 mm spacing throughout the length of the member now there is there is no slip now because the horizontal shear is carried on from the concrete member in flexure to the steel member in flexure below so there's a connectivity and we call it that compatibility that slip resistance is achieved only through shear studs of course there is skin friction but at at a point that's not going to work we need steel studs which are the bolts or nails which are welded to the top of the steel beam to have the composite action to engage the entire slab and steel as a single unit obviously for its advantage and there is a metal deck on the top which provides as a formwork and also when the concrete is poured and it hardens it also acts as a reinforcement on the negative moment region on the top obviously for a, for a member that uh, you, if it's continuous we we know at the, the center we are sogging uh, positive moments at the connections we have negative or hogging moments so at the negative moment this slab deck which could have a different profiles could be hat shaped u shaped dow tail shaped and all that so that acts as a tension reinforcement also in the negative uh, moment region and obviously we need some wire mesh or steel rebars for shrinkage and uh, temperature resistance typically the steel deck will be uh, 60 mm or 50 mm or 70 mm depending on the manufacturer and we have an above concrete slab of 90 mm uh, so uh, total will be around 150 mm of slab thickness now this can span for 10 meters to 12 meters and the i section below it could be 400 or you know uh, 400 to 600 mm deep and the stud diameters are like 19 mm to 22 mm and which are spaced as as requirement or maximum spacing is like 300 mm or 12 inches throughout the member length of the member now the, this shear stud is very important to achieve the composite action the composite action could be served as a percentage you can have 30% 50 40 70% composite action you cannot achieve full composite action because of certain design considerations which we can refer from from their respective